name's Rich, and it is fantastic to be speaking. If we haven't met already, I look forward to meeting you. Um, so we're in this deeper and wider series, and each week we're taking a different biblical character, and we're looking at how in some way they follow God, embodied something of what it means to live for God in their time, and then we're learning what, what does that look like for our time? Like, what can we l- learn from that for today, for how we go about it in the same way? And today we're looking at courage, and we're looking at courage in the complexity of life, because life is complex, and we're going to do it through looking at the life of Esther. There are many ups and downs in Esther's journey of faith. She begins by being thrust into power. She actually ends up enjoying the power that she has uh, quite a lot. Uh, She seems to blend in with her pagan society that surrounds her. Um, She seems to even betray her true identity in the beginning we're going to come to see. So she has like a bit of a rocky start. I don't know if you can relate to that in your faith journey. I certainly can. She has a rocky start, but when her big, big moment comes, she doesn't shy away. When her big moment comes, she steps up to the plate, even if it costs her personally. And I love this story. I'm so glad we're looking at it because I think firstly, Esther's a bit like us. I see myself in her a lot. Like, sometimes my motives are mixed. You know, sometimes I'm torn between doing the right thing and I'm torn between what might feel easier in the moment. I don't know if you can relate to that. It's also a story for our time. It's a story for today. Esther's a believer in a foreign land, and because she's a believer in a foreign land, she is in the minority surrounded by the majority. She's in a minority, in a majority culture that is not her own. It's written at a time when God's people are scattered and they're living in the Persian Empire under foreign occupation. The book of Esther is going to show us something, and this story is going to show us something of how to live for God in a culture that often rejects God, just like our own. It's a story for today. And also, it is a story about how God works through ordinary and everydayness of life. The ordinary and the everydayness of life. You know, God, this might sound really shocking to you, but God isn't mentioned at all in the book of Esther. You think, surely somewhere. I'm going to go back and look and prove Rich wrong. No, but you go and have a look later. I'd encourage you to read the whole thing because we're only looking at a bit of it today. He isn't mentioned at all in all of the 10 chapters. There's no mention of prayer. There's no mention of any religious practices, actually. It's a pretty unique book. But although God's not mentioned, his his divine fingerprints are all over this story. And actually, that's the point. The author, I think, goes out of his way to not mention God because he wants you to see that even when it appears God is silent, even when it appears that he is absent, even when there are crazy things going on, there's some crazy things going on in this story, he's actually always working behind the scenes. He's always working behind the scenes to bring about his purposes in seemingly ordinary, everyday events, happenstances, coincidences. He's working and weaving things together. I guess what I want to ask, does it seem that God is quiet sometimes to you in your life? Do you ever have moments where you feel like, God, what are you up to? Even absent, what are you doing? The book of Esther shows us that even when there are crazy things going on, even when we can't see it, God is always working behind the scenes. So let me introduce, I guess, set the scene and introduce a couple of people to you. First, I'll set the scene. Uh, Where are we up to? Where does this story fit within the biblical story? So up until this point, God's people, they have been living in the land. We learned about that last week. Uh, Tom talked about how they're in the promised land. And God had drawn them out from Egypt and settled them in a place where they could dwell with him. How does God's people thank him for that? Not with much gratitude. They look to other nations' God constantly. They don't look to him, they look to the other nations. And God basically says, okay, like if you want to worship other gods, then you go do that. I will give you over to your desires. I will give you what you want. And he removes this kind of divine hedge of protection, and he lets other nations overtake them for a period of time. Not forever, for a period of time. He uses other nations as a tool to bring them back to their senses and to bring them back to himself. And that is where Esther's set. Like, that's the backstory. And then here we are. So this is 100 years after King Nebuchadnezzar has sacked Jerusalem. Okay? So a story we were looking at last week with Tom. This is 100 years later. 
And this is exactly where it is. Go to the next slide. So there's Jerusalem and there's Susa. And the whole of the red, that is the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was huge. Let me introduce a couple of characters to you. Firstly, we are introduced to Mordecai and Esther. And these are two Jews. Can I have my Mordecai and my Esther, please? You just stand over there for me. These are two Jews, and they are living in Persia. And uh, important for you to know that up until this point, Mordecai actually has been raising Esther. Mordecai is Esther's cousin, because very sadly, Esther's parents died. So he had taken her under a wing. Yep, that's right. Taken her under a wing, and he had raised her to this point. Next, we have King Xerxes. Can I have my King Xerxes, please? Kings are, oh, they're not sure about you. <laughs> I actually, at this point, have a prop for you. I have two. So, Xerxes, could you just pop that on oh, for me? Xerxes orange. Yeah, there you go. And it's important for you to know about King Xerxes that he likes a drink. There you go, Xerxes. <laughs> and he's very, very powerful. He has a huge kingdom. <laughs> Next, we're introduced. To, do you know how to put it on? Well, I, I don't think it's going to fit around here. Oh, it will, it will. Don't worry, it's elastic. Yes, that's fine. Yes, it's for my child, but it will fit. All right. There you go. All right. Next, we are introduced to Haman. Please, can I have my Haman come and join me? <laughs> and um, Haman is actually uh, the villain of the story. So here you go, Haman. Let, don't break it. Zoe will be mad if you break that. <laughs> Zoe. Yeah. Exactly. You should be scared. Okay, so the story begins, just roll with this. The story begins with Xerxes, and your kingdom, Xerxes, it is epic, it is huge. And you decide, like, why have a big kingdom if you can't show it off in front of everyone? So you go, I'm going to have a banquet. I'm going to have a huge banquet, which is really like a vanity parade. Because what he does, he, t he takes 180 days to parade all that he owns in front of his officials. It's 180 days because he's got a lot of stuff takes a long time. So 180 days. And then on the last day, he's really drunk. It went on for 180 days. You might be thinking, I think I'd be really drunk if I was at a 180 day banquet. So he's really drunk and he decides he's going to call upon his queen, Queen Vashti. Okay, so Vashti though, because he, you know, he wants to show off all that he's got. He wants to say, come on, in front of all my friends. So Vashti, this is for you Vashti, just, but just wait there actually. Just pop that on for me. So Queen Vashti decides, I'm not coming. <laughs> She's not coming. She's not making her way up. She's not coming. She, surprise, surprise. It's no big deal. But the problem is now that the king has egg on his face, okay? Because this is in a shame and honor culture. This is a really big deal. All your friends are watching, and you, your queen hasn't come, and you're not happy. And... Yeah, exactly. So you can, uh, Amy, you can take a seat now. Don't worry, you've had some integrity. And, uh, and she decides, I'm not coming. So he's like, I need now a new queen. So Xerxes deposes Vashti. She's not happy with how he's made her look in front of all these people. And Esther suddenly steps in to the fray. <laughs> and he basically says, I'm going to have a beauty uh, pageant, and a beauty parade. And I'm going to, whoever wins, they will be my queen. And, and Esther wins. Okay. So could we have the crown now? Come and give it to Esther. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. And now, so Esther, I'm going to need you to go to uh, Xerxes now. And, and Mordecai is devastated because Mordecai has been looking after uh, Esther for all this time. He's been raising her, and now she's been taken. And we're not told how she feels about it, but I can't imagine she's particularly happy. And then Mordecai tells Esther, who tells, who tells the king, who gets, sorry, Mordecai overhears a plot to kill the king. Okay, this is a complex story. Okay? Mordecai overhears a plot to kill the king, and all of a sudden, it's, uh, he gets all the credit. So the, the king hears it, even though he's drunk, he plays along, and he hears it, and he gets the credit. So this is good news. You're now in the good books. Okay, then he demands everyone kneel down before him. This is Haman's demand. He says, uh, I need everyone in the kingdom to kneel down before me. But Mordecai refuses. And we're not told why he refuses. 
Maybe because he realizes he's not meant to be worshipping other gods, maybe even, let alone human leaders. We don't really know why, we're not told. But Haman is just filled with rage. You're filled with rage, mate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the thing that we see in this is there's, you need to say Haman uh, is actually an Agagite. And he was a descendant of the Canaanites. And because he's a descendant of the Canaanites, there's this long standing hostility. And because he's so furious, his anti-Semitism kind of seems to kick in. And he says, Mordecai, not just you, but all the Jews are going to pay for this. Because he knows he finds out you're a Jew. All the Jews are going to pay for this. 15 million. And there's this plot to kill all the Jews, to annihilate them. Okay? Which is a lot of people. And they celebrate their terrible decision by getting drunk again. Okay? So these two, drinking buddies, get drunk again. Terrible decision. All the people are bewildered. They're getting drunk. This is terrifying, tyrannical leadership on display. So now the only hope for the Jewish people is Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai gets a message to Esther, and he says, look, this is the time to reveal your true identity, to plead for your people. Up until this point, she had kept it quiet. He doesn't know that she's a Jew. This is your moment. And now Esther sends a message back saying, listen, it's too costly. There's a law. I will be killed if I approach and haven't been summoned then it's not going to go well for me. But he reminds her of it, the fact that, you know, this is your people, and actually you're not going to escape this either. And he, he says, who knows, but that you've come to your position for such a time as this. <clears throat> Esther responds, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. The rest of the five chapters, we see Haman's ultimate downfall, we see Mordecai's rise to prominence in the kingdom, and the whole book culminates with God's people being saved from this terrible decree because an immigrant woman who was taken as a slave finds a voice, pleads with a king, brings down the most powerful official in the land, and averts genocide for God's people. That's your whistle-stop tour. We had to cover a lot of ground there. Let's thank our willing participants. You can take your seats. Listen, what can we take from this story? Well, I want to firstly say Esther moves from blending in to speaking up. You know, um, this story shows us the formative power our environments can have on us when you look at Esther's life. And I know Esther is often known just for her bravery and for her courage, but if you take a closer look at her story, it actually doesn't kind of begin that way. As I've said, she spends the first four chapters blending in. Seems to just go along with everything that's asked of her. Everything that was distinctive about her and her faith seems hidden. In chapter 2, verse 10, it says Esther had not revealed her national identity and family background. She assimilates with this new culture pretty quickly. She doesn't kick up a fuss. It's interesting, in my preparation, um, Esther kind of gets it from all sides because of her early beginning. So kind of the more feminist, progressive writers think that she's totally sold out because she basically becomes like the trophy wife. She just goes along with stuff because she becomes a a blank page for the king to write whatever story he wants without objection. Unlike Vashti, who actually they all really love, because like Vashti, she had some integrity. She says, I'm not coming to your parade. I'm not coming to your party. Esther silently obliges. And then she also gets it from the other side. So the more conservative commentators, they all say she forgets her religious identity. Like that's why they don't like her in the early parts of the story. She disregarded the Jewish, the Jewish dietary laws. She ate the king's food. So chapter 2, verse 9, so she pleased him, she won his favor, and immediately he provided for her with beauty treatments and special food. This is someone she's not yet married to. And you might think, well, who cares about dietary laws? Like, is that that big a deal? But the bigger principle was trusting God's law and trusting that he knew what was best for her and trusting that and being a distinct people. And she wasn't. This is utterly different. It might draw your mind back to another story of people in exile. What did the young boys in the book of Daniel do? Well, the young boys in the book of Daniel immediately says, I'm not going to eat the king's food. And they refuse. They seem to say, make a stand on that. Next, she goes along, as I've said, with all these beauty treatments, without objection, and she sleeps with and marries outside of the Jewish community. She breaks the marriage laws. She's yet to make a stand. Was she comfortable with all of this, this new life? Like, was she a force, or was she just a willing participant 
Was she hating every minute of it secretly? Was she loving every minute of her new life? We're actually not told, and the writer didn't tell us. We just don't really know. But I think whatever you make of her early choices, compromised or just in a tough position with like little choice, the wider point I see here is that God is able to work his purposes in and through the complicated messiness of life, all of our messiest situations. I just want to say, if you ever feel like you've blown it with God, you ever feel like because of your track record, like he must just be done with you because of things you've done, things that have been done to you, situations, scenarios that you've found yourself in. He's probably moved on, right? He's probably going to use someone else. Like, that's it. He's moved on. Not the God of the Bible. We see it time and time again. He's always ready to use those who make themselves available. He's not done with you. He's not done with you. Other people may write you off, but he will not. He's not done with you, and he's not done with Esther, as we're about to see. Because even if she started badly, she steps up to the plate when it matters most. You get this back and forth, as we've seen, between Mordecai and Esther, all through a mediator. Verse 8 tells us that he tells her to go to the king's palace and plead with him for God's people, for her people. She says, look, I'm signing my own death warrant doing that. No way. Unless he holds out the gold scepter, I'm done. And Mordecai says in verses 13 and 14, but don't think that just because you're in the king's palace, the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. If you remain silent at such a time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But who knows that you've come to your royal position for such a time as this? He's basically saying he believes God will come through no matter what, even if she becomes silent. Like, he's bigger, he's more powerful, he will. But basically he's saying, don't miss your moment. Like, could this be what all this is leading up for? You almost hear him searching for some purpose in amongst this painful situation. She's been ripped away from him, from his household, made to serve this king. She's gone along with it, but he's like, maybe all of this mess was for a purpose. Maybe God had a purpose in this for you and for his people. Don't miss your moment. She had this incredible response. Go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and my attendants will fast as you do, and when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. You seem to see she moves from self-preservation to selfless sacrifice. There's progression in her story. And we've got to ask, what changed? Like one minute, she's given all the reasons why it's too risky. Like, not me, I can't do it. And the next minute, she has this resolve of, if I perish, I perish. What changed? Some of the commentators suggest that her contact with Mordecai almost reminded her of her true identity and what God has done for her. She remembers who she is, who God is to her, and that's what changed. We don't really know because the text doesn't actually give any explanation. It's astounding, really. All we know is that she risks it all to save God's people. She seems to come to an understanding that her high position and her privilege isn't just to be enjoyed, but actually it is a responsibility to steward, to save others. And that her, their problem has become her problem because she's in the best position to do something about it. It's important at this point we ask, like, this isn't just an old story to learn from, but what are our Esther moments? Like, what are your Esther moments? Maybe you won't be called in front of a king to save an entire people group. Like, I, I, I imagine not. But where do you need the courage of God to do the right thing in really tricky situations. You know, I, um, I had a friend that used to live in Manchester, and um, he was leaving his house early one morning, and he witnessed a murder, okay, from a distance, but he witnessed somebody being killed, an altercation between two people. And it was this incredible story, really, because it would have been so much easier for him to pretend he hadn't seen what he had seen. He knew straight away who it was. It was a very dangerous part of Manchester where he lived. And he was called upon by the police. He gave evidence. He had his car keyed. He used to have, they used to put feces through his letterbox. And eventually, there was threats on his life, and he had to move out. Because basically, he was saying, I'm, I'm going I'm to stand up to this, to this power on this estate. I'm going to stand up to this person. It would have been so much easier for him to have pretended he hadn't seen what he'd seen. But he needed God to give him the courage to stand strong, even when 
everything about him was just like, I just wish I didn't go out my house that day. I just wish I had left five minutes later. But the reality is, he stepped up. He saw that he had a responsibility to partner with God in bringing justice to a very powerful person where he lived who sowed fear into that neighborhood for many years. And he did it. He didn't shy away from his moment. Even though, actually, it did cost him personally. It cost him a lot. I want to ask, what is it for you? Like, that might sound like, you know, I hope not, but you never know. We don't know the situations we find ourselves in. For some of you, it might be just as simple as being more open and honest with your faith. I was chatting with one of our students just this week, actually. and just saying, like, I've just arrived in Leeds, and I just feel this temptation sometimes just to be really quiet about my faith. Like, it would just be so much easier if I just, like, went along, if I didn't, like, tell them that part of my life. Like, it just feels like I would just fit in so much easier. It just feels like I could, you know, be the Esther. Just fit in, go along, go along with everything that's going on. But he knows that even though there might be moments where it costs, he needs to reveal his true identity. He needs to show, he needs to speak up for God. He needs to show who he really is. Or for maybe you are at work and you're in a tough situation. Maybe there's unethical practices that are going on. And you've just seen it for a long period of time and everybody seems to look the other way and you've just been drawn into like just ignoring it and you're like, God, what does it mean for me to be a Christian in this space? What does it mean for me to speak up, even though it might cost me, even though it could cost you? Do we look the, way, uh, the other way with everybody else or do we speak up? I think whatever, whatever it is, we have to settle in our hearts that sometimes doing the right thing, standing up to injustice, will cost us. How do we have the same attitude as Esther? If I perish, I perish. You know, if my reputation perishes with a certain group of people, then so be it. Or if this promotion opportunity doesn't come my way, like, so be it. How do we live in such a way that we're consistently putting ourselves first? Sorry, how do we live in such a way that we're consistently not putting ourselves first, but we're putting God first? The first is easier, the second is harder. I think you've got to know the God who doesn't just say, live for me, but he also died for you. I think if we're going to not give in to compromise, if we're going to not put ourselves first, we must experience something of the love of the one who put us first. You'll always put yourself first until you know somebody else put you first. You, you'll always, because it, it, you'll look out for that number one. But when you know the God of the universe put you first, it changes everything. You know, uh, Paul in the New Testament, he's right into the Philippian church, and he's um, exhorting them not to be selfish, but to look out for the interests of others. And I'm just struck by how he chooses to do it. He doesn't say do it just because it's the right thing to do. He doesn't say, just try really hard. He points them to Jesus. This is what he says. He says, from verse 5, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and, and being found in, a, as, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. At the cross, we see Christ, our Savior, who didn't cling to his life, but he gave it up for us. You see, Esther's life and the story of Esther, it's a mirror and it's pointing to a better Savior. Where Esther hides her identity, she's slow to identify with God's people. Jesus identifies quickly with the brokenness of humanity. Where Esther's willing, where Esther's willing to leave behind her earthly throne, we see Jesus steps down from a heavenly throne. Where Esther advocates for God's people before the king, Jesus is the ultimate advocate for all of, advocate for all of humanity, actually. Where Esther risks her life, Jesus knowingly gives his life and actually perishes for our sake. When we know our lives are secure in his hands, we just won't hold on to them quite so tightly. I think that is the truth for today's passage. How do we live courageously, no matter the cost? Well, actually, we come to know the one who's paid the greatest cost for us. And we say to him, fill us again, make us courageous. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray.
Father God, I thank you that you don't call us to a life that you haven't already lived perfectly. And Lord, I just pray now that in the security of your love, in the security of your sacrifice, we would find the courage to put you first, no matter what it might cost us. Fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord, and make us courageous. For your name's sake.